And what I really want to um, pinpoint here is that we have, um, for my research, this coral or an anemone. And this is a sessile organism. This is not moving. So it's constantly having to adapt to its environment without changing where it's, where it's at. So how does it do that? How does it sense and understand its environment? And so you have an inter environmental interface within that first layer of the organism. And oftentimes, the, there are like different sensory um, proteins. There's a lot of different things going on here, a lot of um, external particles, ligands, as we call them. And so how do our anemone that I'm working with, how do these guys interpret any environmental signals? Does it come from the bacteria cell or just the environment itself? And so one of the ways that they can interpret the environment is through chemosensory proteins. These are proteins that can sit within the cell membrane and actually interpret the environment. And one particular type of chemical sensory protein, because these guys, chemosensory proteins, are chemical sensors, just like their name. And so one particular type are ionotropic, ionotropic glutamate receptors, or IBURs, as I would call them for short. These proteins are tetramers, meaning that they have, are made of four different strands. So here we have a beautiful revolving protein, and this is made up of four identical strands of amino acids, and these guys all line up together and have three main conserved domains. Within a cell, um, they're kind of aligned like this. So we have the extracellular area and the intracellular area. We have those three domains. We have an amino terminal domain, a ligand binding domain, and a transmembrane domain. So the transmembrane domain will sit within the membrane of the cell. So you can see there, it's crossing the cell. And then what we have here on the outside, so facing externally, is the ligand binding domain. And so here is where ligands can come and bind to the cell. So it'll come in like that. And when that happens, there's actually a conformational change. So this protein is changing its formation. And this change allows this transmembrane domain, which has an ion channel, to open. And this allows calcium ions to flow through from the external to the in intracellular part of the cell. And what differentiates these different IUR, so what makes each of them special, is there's different flavors based on their ligands, so based on this ligand specificity. And these are, are external particles that bind to that ligand binding domain. And so some traditional IUR flavors that we have are AMPA, kinate, and NMDA, as well as inotropic receptors. There are some other flavors as well that form um, different clades um, or different classes. There's um, phi, delta, and epsilon. And so these are all different flavors. And over the course of evolution and time and throughout different organisms, we have a whole rainbow of inotropic glutamate receptor flavors. And these um, are arise and are lost throughout our evolutionary tree that I've created here. So if we look at their function, we know that in plants, there are glutamate-like receptors, and these will respond to damage-associated molecular patterns. So if any damage happens to this Arabidopsis plant here, IGLUARs, or um, glutamate-like receptors, actually will respond to this damage, respond to these damps. And then we have these really funky looking tenophores, these guys here. And we have no, we, um, we know that right now that uh, the nervous system, as well as the signaling of the nervous system, depends on these inotropic glutamate receptors. Another organism or um, family of organisms are insects or other um, phyletarians, which are invertebrates. And these have ionotropic receptors, and these are responsible for helping detecting food sources. So, such as we have a male mosquito here, and he is um, being drawn in by different ligands in the environment to go and um, drink some nectar from this flower. Um, we also have specialized organs in snails that um, are chemosensory organs, and 
and flies here that have these um, IRs. And then we have us humans or vertebrates. And we know that these IBLUARs are important for signaling and sending synapses. So here we have um, a synapse going on right here. So you have where the ligands are coming from externally, and then you have the receiving end. And this is where the different IBLUARs are located. But what if we have an animal without a brain? What if we have an Idarian, which is a coral or an anemone, even a jellyfish? My two big questions are, how have IBLUARs changed over time and what are IBLUARs doing in Nidarians? And to do so, I have, to research this, I have my model anemone, Exaptasia pallida, and I just want to remind you, these guys don't have a centralized nervous system. Instead, they have this beautiful nerve net, which is a dispersed nervous system. So they're, um, it's almost like they have a nice big catch-all for everything that goes on, and it actually weaves in between all the different cells. So how I'm going to answer these questions um, is I actually have a few smaller questions. So it's like a rest, Russian nesting doll. We have our two big questions and then multiple questions within inside each of those. And so for each question, I'm going to show the hypotheses with the question, which are in blue, and then in green, the rationale. So why I'm asking this question or why I think is what's going to happen and the methods and then this lovely goldenrod yellow is going to be the findings. So just keep that in mind to help guide you through where we are. So the first question, how have IBLUARs changed over time? And this, for this I'm asking, what is the extent of Nidarian IBLUAR diversity within Exaptasia in relation to other Nidarians and Metazoans? So this is a comparative study. And I'm asking this because I want to reveal the diversity and the different evolutionary relationships between these IBLUR-like genes in Nidarians, as well as comparing to other metazoans, and hopefully help to predict the function. The first step I did is I used phylogenetic analyses using maximum likelihood, which is one method, um, to create a hypothetical evolutionary um, relationships of IBLUR amino acid sequences um, collected from different reference proteins. So to show you my lovely tree, there are 303 sequences up here, and I have um, three Nidarian species. Now, what's important for this tree is, you don't necessarily have to read everything, but I'm just gonna point out, because I'm showing it to you. I have foodstock values, which is the support, so how strongly that divergence and evolution is, is supported. And then I have my different species, which are all color-coded. And then within the tree itself, I have numbered clades, so this would be clade five, and the type of IBLUR they are. So remember before, I talked about IRs. This clade five, these are IRs. So to walk through this um, tree, our first clade, our clade one, are glutamate receptors um, one. So these are IBLUR, um, which are NMDA specific. So remember I talked about the NMDA receptors? This will be one type. Then in clade two, we have um, GLU-N2 and GLU-N3. So these are NMDA two and three, followed by epsilon. So all these here, actually between three and four, are epsilon IBRs. And then clade five is where the IRs pop up, followed by um, six and seven, which are GLU-D. So these are the delta receptors. And then clade eight, which is between split between kinate and AMPA receptors. And what I want to really point out here is that we, out of all eight clades, it's these clades one through four that have Nidarian species. And out of these um, four clades, I found 22 Exaptasia pallida IBLUR protein sequences. So I wanted next to zoom in. So I used another um, method of uh, maximum likelihood phylogenetic analyses, and I use that breakoff point to create a new hypothetical um, 
model of those evolutionary relationships, so those changing relationships um, of the Nigerian Igor sequences, um, building more Nigerian sequences from a database known as um, Reef Genomics. So we have this before, and now we have this clade. And again, I've broken it up. I have support, then I have the different species, and here we, you can see we've extended the number of Nigerian species. I've also added in tenophore and periphera, so sponges. And then, again, same, uh, the, each of the clades is labeled um, 1, 2, um, X, 3, and 4, and then the names for each of the um, IBURs specific to their ligands, so they're different flavors. So here in this tree, uh, clade 1, has, is the um, glue N1, and then in clade 2, we have glue N2 and glue N3, and these actually divide really nicely within this clade, while in the other clade they bunched up a bit more. Then we have this only um, Tina4 sequences forming a clade, followed by um, our clade 3, which has a, um, a clade of sponges, a clade of uh, trickle plaques, so our, our plethozoan, and then um, some Nigerians, and then our clade four, which is only Nigerians. And so I wanna point this out here, that for each of these clades, um, one, two, and three, we have independent Nigerian clades within each of those. So Nigerians that have split off. So those are subclades. And then clade four is only comprised of Nigerians. And this is interesting because here we have a polyphyletic species, so it occurs within multiple clades, while the um, tenophores, the griffins, and the placozoa are monophyletic, so they only occurred in their own clade or one clade. So to follow up looking at the um, differences over evolutionary time, I have asked um, if the protein structures of Exaptasia pallida iguars, which I have called the paliglurs, um, short for Exaptasia pallida, IUR, um, reflect the functional characteristics of classical IURs. And so my hypothesis here is that if Nigerian IUR related proteins show a high conservation, then this will suggest that the Nigerian <coughs> IURs can actually sense chemical cues. So these can be functional proteins that have that transmembrane domain and an ion channel and will respond to external ligands. And the reasoning behind this is because structure predicts function in the terms of proteins. Each of these different conserved domains has a, um, a particular role that it plays in the function. And to do so, I used um, the um, PFAM database to help identify these different conserved domains. And so here I have an alignment, and what I want to point out is um, here we have the different clades. So you see we have clades one, two, three, and four. Then we have the uh, polyglor number. So a little arbitrary here, the numbering system, but just gives you an idea that each of these is a different gene or protein. And then I have the different conserved domains. Remember from the beginning when I was introducing you to each of the um, amino acid strands, these have um, three conserved domains, the amino terminal domain, which really isn't quite as conserved compared to the ligand binding and the transmembrane domain. And these two domains are actually the most important for the function of each of the IBOR because this is where our ligand will bind and then where the ions can pass through with the, um, with the transmembrane domain that creates that ion channel. And to conclude from this portion, there isn't necessarily a conserved um, pattern across these clades for each of the IULRs, um, but the, we do see those conserved archetypal domains of the ligand binding domain and the transmembrane domain, which shows us that we do have some very promising IULRs uh, within Exceptasia. So for this first part to summarize, um, how have IULRs changed over time? Well, we know that they are present up through um, our clade 5, which are the IRs, um, and throughout the um, NMDA-specific receptors. And we also know that they have those conserved domains, so they can function as IVORs 
with the ligand binding domain and the transmembrane domain. So this brings me to my next question. We know some of the evolution now. We know we have functional proteins. But what do these functional proteins actually do? What is their function? And so my next question was, what are IBUARs doing in Nigerians? And to do so, I'm using my model, Exceptasia pallida, to ask, what's going on here? Like, what is it responding to? Um, what causes these guys to be expressed? So on and so forth. And so the first item that I looked at are, where are IBUARs lo localized within Exceptasia pallida? So here I have my anemone, um, which is also um, similar to a coral polyp. So if you have a coral, it's a colonial organism. Each of these is a polyp, a whole bunch of them together makes your coral colony. And the basic parts of my anemone is we have different we have the tentacles outside that wave in the air. Then we have the mouth where it eats and poops. And then we have the pharynx and the gastric cavity, so that's where the um, all the food sits and it's digested, you get all our nutrients from there. And then um, when this is all within the trunk, we have the pedal disc, which is where the anemone adheres to the surface. And that's why we got that nice sessile creature. And we can look underneath the microscope, and this is what we'll see. If we take a cross section of an anemone tentacle, you'll actually see that there's two different major cell layers. We have an epidermis and a gastrodermis. This gastrodermis is inside. This is where those symbiotic organisms I talked about are. They are called Symbiodineaceae, really fun to say. Um, and these guys actually will provide nutrients to our coral host. These are um, organisms that can photosynthesize and create some energy in exchange um, for living in, inside the anemone cells, all safe and sound. We also have some carotenoids, which give color. Um, to the anemones to a degree. You can see those on the, underneath the scope. Then we have this mesoglia, which is, an inter, um, which is a little like interstitial cell space, followed by um, the top layer, which is the epidermis. So within the epidermis, we have a lot going on here. We have muscle cells, we have ganglion cells. So these are cells that can help send signals. Um, this is part of that neurosensory um, dispersed nervous system. And then there are um, different sensory cells that poke outside, have receptors on them. Um, we have little spirocytes, which we can see here. These guys are actually have a super coiled up, um, kind of a little line, and then they have that tethers the um, the hook. So if you have you ever stuck your hand into a touch pool and touch anemones, and you know how the anemones will stick to your fingers. So when you do so. Is these spirocytes and other nematocytes, which act very similarly, similarly, that will attach to your skin and make it sticky. And so that's how they bring in food, capture any of those like little shrimps or little micro um, organisms that are floating around in the water. So they they also eat those. And then if you look up from the top at the epidermis, the cells look a bit like this. You can see like different parts. Um, but it almost looks like a pattern quilt from the top. And um, I just want to show you that because we'll look at some um, external photographs later. So I hypothesize that IGUARs are likely to be located <coughs> in sensory tentacle cells and phagocytic tissues. Because this is where we're taking up, this is where the organism is going to be interacting with the external environment, right? And so, and yeah, exactly. So localizing where these are found will aid and will also aid in identifying the function of um, Nigerian IGORs because we are identifying the cells that they're associated with, and the cells that they're associated with have particular um, value to the organism. So they have particular functions, and we can align the proteins with the function of those cells so we know what they are doing. And to do so, I um, localize these IGORs using in situ hybridization. And what in situ hybridization is, is when you have an anemone um, and within any organism, you have DNA, which codes for all the different genes. And so within different cells, you are going to have that DNA trans, um, transcribed into mRNA. So this is the messenger RNA, and this is the formula on how to make protein. With, um, and this is translation. And so what I focus on is gene expression. And the first step of gene expression 
would be the synthesis of mRNA. So I can focus on that, and it's only within the cells that want to actually make the protein that the mRNA will be expressed. And how I look at where the mRNA is with in-situ hybridization is I will have a complementary or an antisense probe. So this is a sequence that's exactly, exactly the opposite of this sequence, so it can adhere. And this probe has um, a little um, flag on it, in my case, DIG. And what happens is I can put this into an antibody. So I put it into an antibody that will identify that um, part. And then I will develop it like a photograph using um, AP enzyme or alkaline phosphatase. So very similar to a photograph, I put my region in and very slowly it will get color. And then I have to rinse it off and stop that process. And then what happens is I have, wherever those proteins are found, is I will have little purple spots. And I just want to bring in again my hypothesis uh, that IGORs are likely to be um, located within those sensory um, cells and the phagocytic tissues, like here. That's the pattern we see. So for my results of my in-situ hybridization, um, I have each of these pictures is a different probe, and each of the probes is made for a specific IGOR gene. So here we have 1, 2, 4, 8, 10, 12, 15, 21, and 22. So if you see those numbers, those are going to be different IGORs. And what we can first see of these um, whole mountain situs is that the anemone's tentacles seem to have a lot more of that blue-purple look. This one, the tentacles don't have as much, but you can see some spots right there on the body, on the trunk of the animal. So what I did next was I took pictures of the tentacles because I really wanted to examine um, the expression pattern and take a cross-section image like this so I could identify where exactly these um, iGLORs were expressed in comparison. And when you look at an anemone tentacle underneath the microscope, you have the gastroderm where you have the symbiogenesia, and then the ectoderm or the epidermis is where um, you have the little spirocytes, which have like these like really tight coils, and then nematocytes here. So they have like this medial line and they're much longer cells. And looking at these tentacles with their um, with the probes, you can see that some of them have much more even expression, um, while others have more of a um, very specific dispersed expression or higher expression in some areas versus others. So those that have the expression with, that's very even throughout the epidermis, my thought is that these are probably uh, associated with purely sensory. So, so these are the tentacles, these are where everything is being sensed and interpreted. And we compare that to those like 4 and 12 especially, and 22, where we see these little hot spots. So it's more dispersed um, vocalization. And so then I wanted to compare what the epithelial looked like, um, epithelium looked like, and um, take a look at the trunk here. So this is what um, a sense probe, so the control would look like. And then we take a look at the um, epithelial. And so you can see here, that's a tentacle, so that doesn't count. Um, but not really much any staining here with this antisense probe. Um, there's some here, a bit, bit of background noise. Um, but then 12, that one I pointed out earlier that didn't have so much of a blue um, tentacles, there's, um, there's a lot of um, dispersed um, signals or localization here. And then 21 and 22, not so, not as much, but here we see some at eight. But so, um, oh, in this photo of 22, we got it wrong. Yeah. So, so in these um, different IGLORs, we actually see that there is an expression pattern that is throughout the body. So tentacles and trunk. And um, my my conclusions from this portion are that epithelial mRNA is primarily located within the outer tissue layers of tentacles, and four of the genes are expressed throughout the entirety of the anemone. And these, this expression pattern may actually follow the nerve nets, so maybe more tied with the signaling 
of the nervous system of the anemone versus purely a, an environmental stimulus, which is what the tentacles would get. So kind of acting like a very dispersed brain, but not centralized. <laughs> Uh, so to continue, um, what are Iguvars doing in Nidarians? And the first question, or the main question I'm asking for this is, um, how are Iguvars functionally expressed in Exceptasia pallida? And I'm asking this because I want to identify different instigators of a pallibular expression. And to do so, I'm doing um, two different steps. First, I am examining the response to pathogenic bacteria. And then, based on what I saw in the controls, I am measuring their daily expression cycles because I did notice that there's some change, just natural variation, and I wanted to map that over the course of 24 hours. So for this experiment, again, we're looking at that mRNA, that gene expression, using quantitative PCR. So we're identifying that mRNA, and we are quantifying it to compare the relative amounts between different treatments. So how much RNA is actually there, between. So the first part, my question is, what is the involvement of Nigerian iglovars during the defense response to pathogenic microbial challenges? And my hypothesis is um, that if the relative gene expressions are altered as a function of microbial challenges, then this suggests that those iglovars are likely components of like the immune defense or um, at least an, um, a recognition or effector function process. Like they're involved in the identification of the microbes within the environment. So my experiment was set up like this. I have three different treatments. I have the control, uh, I have Serratia marcescens and Vibrio carlyticus, which are both coral pathogens. And then I have um, a, a nice long sampling period. So I sampled three anemones at zero hours, at 24 hours, at 48 hours, at 72, 96, and then all the way to four weeks after that initial time point. And within my challenges, I added in the bacteria at zero hours and then using our findings um, within my lab from Tanya Brown from her previous experiments, I was able to use sublethal, so before my anemones would die because I wanted to make sure that they were gonna live out here so I could sample them. Um, I removed the bacteria at 48 for Serratia marcescens and 72 hours for Vibrio carlyticus. So here we actually get some time points immediately after the bacteria has been removed, as well as four weeks later. And so, my findings are a bit busy, so hold tight. I'll walk you through these graphs. Um, these are, each of these graphs represents a different gene. So I have I will are 1, 2, 23, 21, 4, and 8. And then each of these graphs, we have the relative expression. So for each of them, our y-axis is 0 and negative 4. Um, this, or, six and negative four, and then zero is where the control is because I'm comparing to the control. And then on the bottom, I have each of the time points. So I have zero, 24, 48, 72, 96, and four weeks. And what I found is that with four and eight, there really was not any significant change when I um, analyzed using statistical analysis. So I did an analysis of variance, which means I was looking at to see if any of these, back, if the treatments of the bacteria actually caused a change in the expression. And so what I found is that for these two, no, not so much. But for 1, 2, 23, and 21, yes, there was a significant effect of adding in our bacteria so that the, um, the actual expression, so the amount of what would, we would assume would end up as functional protein is changing, either being increased or decreased. And you can see in a few of them, there is a pattern where we have like a dip and then an increase, a little increase, dip, increase. So we're kind of always ending up on a high note for all of these um, expression patterns. So to summarize here, um, a polygolar's one, two, 21, and 23 do respond to bacterial um, challenges um, via transcription. So transcription is our mRNA expression. 
And the fact of our sessions actually did significantly influence one and two um, in comparison. And then there were there was some variation among the controls. And so what I'm proposing here is that they are probably involved in defense response. Um, we have this external cell in, or in our case bacteria, and there's something, some communication that is occurring here that is changing the amount of IBORs um, in response to the bacteria there. So from here I can I can predict that palliolar transcription levels can change with um, changing microbial environments, especially when we have steratia. But what is the role of Nidarian IBORs within the biological cycle? And so here I'm going to identify the, continue to identify the functional changes in IBOR expression. <coughs> and so my hypothesis is that if Nigerian IBORs follow a true circadian rhythm, there will be one peak and one trough. So a circadian rhythm is like our sleep, typically. We go to sleep once during the day, and then we're up for the rest of the time of the day. And to go with this, we also um, have some knowledge that the amount of glutamate synthase increases at night, increasing the amount of glutamate at night. So it's possible that Nigerian IBORs may follow the physiological changes of glutamate amounts. And so then, if we're increasing our glutamate, we may decrease the amount of RNA transcription in response to increasing glutamate. Because we're like, no, I, there's too much. And we don't want to cause a misfiring or send false signals within our organism. So my experimental setup was like this. Um, each of these anemones represents five anemones because I did this five different times. Um, first, all these anemones have been kept in a 12 light, 12 dark cycle before they have been moved to their experimental treatment, which is between 12 light, 12 dark. So those guys stayed the same. And then 12 dark, 12 darker, dark, dark. Um, and I did this 24 hour adjustment because this has actually been um, set as a um, best practices. There might be some just immediate leftovers from that light cycle, some more diel um, or that daily light triggers may, um, may continue within this first 24 hours. So I wanted to make sure I didn't have any of that within my sampling. And then I sampled every four hours. So I have um, in the morning, 10 hundred hours, and then going to the afternoon, 14, 18, 22, we're getting late, getting tired, 12, where I'm waking up and getting in my sleeping bag, and six, where I'm also waking up and getting my sleeping bag in the office. Um, and so, so that's our sampling. And I measured this between two different genes. So I have um, a palliolar two and a palliolar eight. I want to remind you that these were sampled previously. And two responded to Serachium vibrio, while eight did not. So we can compare here between these two, like whether it's responding to bacteria or not. So what I found um, was, again, using quantitative PCR, so same methods that I just used. And here I have my findings for um, a polyglar 2. So here um, we have the sampling between the light light, or light dark and dark dark treatments. And then we have our um, relative expression. And so these are relative to one another. And each of these little black boxes, the letters, represents the differences based on ANOVA analysis. So we can say that, OK, so this 1,800 hours in the uh, light-dark treatment is significantly differ, different in expression to this dark-dark um, dark at 1,800 hours because it has letter A. And we see that here in the dark dark, there's much more variation and variation within. So here between this um, 200 hours in the morning is significantly different from both the 22 and the 100 hours versus within light dark. These are only, this point is only significantly different from these guys. So what I did, because I can't necessarily make out a cycle here, is I ran um, a rhythmic expression analysis through R and this actually helps me interpret what I can't see with my eye by measuring the differences and the changes. And so I found that in this light dark treatment, there's actually an eight hour period and that changes to a 16 hour period 
in the dark, dark treatment. There's also an increase in the amplitude, so an increase in the extreme differences between those different expression points. So I did this again with eight, and what I found is that um, between the two, again, we have the hours of the days, the changes, our light dark, our dark dark, is I actually saw, hey, that looks like there's one peak, and on my edges, it looks pretty low. So that could be a 24-hour um, cycle going on here. And when I ran the JTK cycle analysis, I found out, yes, this is a 24-hour um, period, but a pretty small amplitude, it's 0.5 amplitude. While here, in our light dark, again, we see that eight-hour period, which is exactly what we saw in the, um, in the palette blur two. So what I can surmise here is that changing the diurnal cycle lengthens the period of the palette blur expression patterns um, from eight hours in the light dark to um, in both for both two and eight. And so what's going on here? What's happening with this um, cyclical transcription changes in endosymbiosis? And so what I'm proposing here is that we have our lovely um, symbiote in ACA, so our alpha symbiote, and when we add light, the um, amount of like metabolites when it's getting off actually increases. And so this could affect either could go right to the nucleus or could possibly talk um, either directly or indirectly to the IGLVARs and create a negative feedback loop or a positive feedback loop. Um, so here, and I'm thinking more of a more of a negative because I had a decrease at um, after the period of daytime, and so this will decrease the amount of IGLVAR that's being made either way. So what I can say is that I know of Hollywood transcription levels change with the changing environments. So we have um, 1, 2, 21, and 23 respond to those bacterial challenges, while um, 2 and 8 expression rhythms um, change with diurnal cycles. And here we can see, you know, we have our bacteria cell, we have the, the um, reactions between these, here we have a sensory cell, and our um, gastrodermic symbiotes, and when we um, add light, there's some signaling going on. If we add bacteria, there's some signaling going on, changing those transcription levels. So to summarize, big chart, we're going to focus on um, epilogulars that are, are most abundant within clades two and four. And so to zoom into the ones that I further analyzed, um, we have clade four, which are Nidarian um, blue E, or the Igor Epsilon clade. Then we have um, one that is a Nigerian NMDA, one that's grouped with the NMDA1, so the glue N1, and then one that's solely in the glue E, so it was with that clay that was next to the um, Trichoflax or Placozoan species. So what I found is there's not, I can't say that there is any um, pattern or correlation between the clay and the immune response because here, um, in clade four, I have responses, and then I don't have any responses. Um, two and three both respond, but those are just one for each of the um, IGLRs. So I can't say there's necessarily anything important about being in a particular clade or being a particular type of IGLR. But then I can take a look deep inside and look with that um, clade four, um, so our gluey Nigerians, and we see you know one response bacteria, one doesn't. Um, they both change, though, with that um, expression, so the biological rhythmicity um, changes when you remove, it actually increases when you remove the light. And then um, I just, I want to take a look at the expression in the tentacles, or between the two. So here you can see we had significant change, not significant change. You can see that, I mean, there's, that's one outlier point, but very high error bars, I mean, there's between my battle replicates, there was a lot of difference. And then both of them changed in their um, pattern. This one actually went to possibly circadian pattern if it's not dependent on the somatic AC. And then Igular 8, actually here, it's pretty dispersed while this one isn't. So perhaps because Igular 8 isn't, doesn't respond to bacteria, maybe it is more since it's dispersed 
responsible for acting within the nervous system versus here in two, which is solely found in the tentacles, perhaps that one is more responsible for responding to bacteria. And um, to reiterate that again, uh, we see that across different, so across like 12, 4, 22, 15, and possibly 8 as well, that this is outlining our nervous system and responsible for sending signals between um, within our anemone. And, um, and we do see um, there is somewhat of a pattern where these um, ones that respond to bacteria are mostly within the tentacles, while, you know, if they don't respond to that, or while, you know, those that don't, they are also localized within the trunk. So what is next? Um, my next steps are to determine the expression patterns and potential apalyvular co-receptor pairs and determine which ligands um, that these apalyvlurs will respond to using known chemicals. So this way I actually can say, hey, these proteins respond to this. And then we can slowly solve the pattern that goes on here and then greater understand it and what's happening in an anemone. So with that, I would just like to thank you all for being here. I want to thank my um, committee members, Dr. Mauricio rodriguez Lanetti, who has been my advisor these past almost five years. Um, I want to thank Virginia Weiss for Skyping in today. And then I also would like to thank Dr. Kalima T, Dr. Laura Service, and Dr. Matt DeGenero for being here. Um, I also want to thank um, people, some uh, other um, professors who have helped me, including um, Dr. Jessica Silver Liebelace for all of her help, especially in these last few months. Um, and we just submitted a paper last night. So my first paper that's been submitted. <laughs> also, uh, Dr. Ann Tarrant um, at Bowie, who has helped me with the circadian um, rhythm experiments. Um, my undergraduates who couldn't make it um, and have actually have graduated themselves now, um, Beatrice Madero and Melissa Lagunas, and everyone in the Images Lab. Thank you guys so much for all your help. Thank you for being here. Um, today and now I'm just going to do a little bit of um, tear jerk stuff. So um, I started, you know, as a young little kid in Oregon at the beach, met my first marine biologist when I was eight years old. She's from Kentucky. Her name's Brooke. I can still remember that almost 20 years later. Um, and really who I have to thank for this are my parents um, for all that they have done for me. Um, these past few years, especially, have been really tough living so far away from them, and they've also raised uh, four kids, <laughs> including myself, and the youngest one now just graduated from college, so she's graduated. And then you guys might notice that there are a lot of people here today, and a lot of those people are in my running group. Um, when In my second year here in Miami, I started running um, with this group at Footworks, and they have truly helped me complete this. I would probably not be here so it weren't for them and for all their support. And um, I especially want to give a shout out to my Miami parents <laughs> who really took me under their wing and now they're here today. Um, so thank you, Mark and Jen. I love you. And Courtney, my own stepmom. Thank you so much for coming as well. I really appreciate it. And so with that, <laughs> Are there any questions? <laughs> okay, so being your mother, <laughs> why did you decide to study? Um, System so I think this is um, using a sessile organism and an, and an organism that is so what is considered as basal, so basic, um, actually finding these proteins that are involved in our brains and actually have been linked to Alzheimer's and other neural degeneration. I'm really interested in understanding what they're doing and what they're responding. And we have these animals that don't really degenerate. I mean, they get sick, but mostly from external 
not from an internal breakdown, but from external factors. So I think that's really interesting, and that can actually be something to apply to human health in the future, um, which you know is very sexy for funding and everything. <laughs> Yes, Nicole. Is there any other support for the reasoning behind survival first influencing the uh, kinds of laws and regulations? Yes, actually, um, I have a slide for that. Um, I didn't have time to present that today, but um, there has been more cycling of IPLURs as well as um, IPLUR related, um, so like glutamate synthesizing and related um, genes within another, um, well, it's Aptasia, which Exaptasia used to belong to that genus, but we have um, Aptasia diaphana, and um, I data mined there because they didn't really go into much of this. Like they they looked at um, these expression patterns and how they changed, but they didn't actually pinpoint all the IGLURs that are involved there. And so we actually have like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven IGLURs, and they found that these will actually change their period. Um, between symbiotic and aposymbiotic states. So within um, symbiotic state, they tend to have a period of 24 hours. Well, if you remove the symbionts, their period goes to 12 hours. And they've called this a circuitidal rhythm because it's about every 12 hours, just like it goes with the tides, because we have one high tide, one low tide, another high tide, another low tide, every other every 24 hours. Um, and um, and they actually and they do reinfection studies too, so they were able to say like yes, the symbiodinium are actually or symbiodiniaceae are actually causing this. So. Yes. And may I see your large phylogenetic screen, in, please? <laughs> we're gonna have to back it up. Sorry. There's a lot of slides. Yes. So if I remember correctly, um, you would be, um, you're saying that's epsilon, right? Yes. And then C4, you said, was part of epsilon? Yes. So in your tree here, epsilon would not be one by that. Correct? Yes, yeah. Okay, so there was previous studies that show like epsilon was monophonetic and you but you're finding a new C4 that makes it non-monophonetic or so or shouldn't be epsilon. So what I'm suggesting here is not honestly that it is because there's really not a huge support like this. I mean, this is still between 51 and 75 percent. Um but but what I'm proposing is that this is a specific to Nigerian epsilon group. Although it's not one of my letters that they're winning this still. Yes. Okay. Or it could be, a, or we could even diverge it from epsilon and just call it Nigerian IGLURs. A different one. Yeah. So in the, in the, when you zoom in, right, in that second, the following tree, So CX is what? CX is our lovely uh, Tina Four Tina sequences. Yeah. Then you didn't have them in the previous one. I didn't have them in the previous one. So the previous um, phylogenies had been focused had been from the reference proteome group, and then these, um, including some of the sequences I brought over to fill in the um, NMD one, two, and three, and the GLUE. Um, those, um, these are all from the reef genomics, so they're like added in. Yeah. So you mentioned as well that um, in the previous one you had less resolution in some of these nodes as opposed to Yeah, that. some of the, some of the nodes didn't have as high support and actually like, I mean there's not as many nodes because here we only have 174 sequences. Mm -hmm. A hundred of them, a hundred of them are Nigerians. Um, on the other, we had three hundred three sequences, 
Um, so much bigger. So that's also like why I didn't include all the Nigerians in that one, just because it's a very large. Um, and those ones also mainly came from all the reference podium databases, aside from the Exaptasia, which when I was starting this, like I, the reference podium wasn't officially like out yet. So I was using what I had on the um, database for the Greek genomics. Thank you. You chose the good strains, as I said, when you're Is there evidence that these two particularly affect anemone? Affect what? Anemone. Anemones? Yeah. yeah. So these are, um, both of these bacteria are very often used for um, different Nigerians, so either anemones or coral, because there are known pathogens. So it's kind of like the gold standard to use those. And I'm really not sure why there's a difference between the um, Seracia versus Vibrio because we have the two of the genes actually were affected by solely the Seracia and then just by the bacteria treatment in general. Um, but my assumption that it could be based on the metabolites that are produced, um, there is actually one there's a quote I wrote down, which I'm sure a lot of you know. Um, it's from I'm gonna find my book. Dobzhansky. It's the uh, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And so um, one of the papers that I was reading this last week discussed that quote. And um, when you think about it, for all these organisms, um, they're going to be encountering microbes because those are around. And it makes sense to have a, um, a nervous system or these neurons. And these nerve neurons are probably interacting with these uh, microorganisms, with the bacteria. And in response, they can actually send out um, antibac antimicrobial neural peptides. And so this, actually, this might be why we're seeing this change in regulation, because it's a part of that signaling process that's acting, you know, in the in the grand scheme of things, immunity, if anything, like if we're going to put it in the biggest branch, under chemo sensing, because this is where we're really just whatever is out there, we are we're sensing it. But it could also be strain specific, right? Because if you have gotten a strain that has been uh, um, or this domesticates a strain. Yes, yes, and that's you, that's you possible. Would, uh, have the issue. Right? And so it would only be possible if you tested other strains. Yes, and I did not. I did not test two strains. I tested the strains that we have in our lab, mm -hmm. and that I know I knew the sublethal time period of because they had been used previously on our anemones. How do you remove the bacteria once you've introduced them in your in your experiments? Well, I do the best I can. I um, <laughs> I remove all the water and I flush it with um, autoclave seawater. And I actually, um, I also moved the anemones to new well plates. And so I, I did that with all of them. I did with the control as well. Like I moved it to a new well plate after the bacteria had been removed. And they don't, at the end of your experiment, no. they, they haven't? No, and I, I mean, I continue to change the water, especially, um, so they're not, because they're, they're in 12 well, or 12, yeah, 12 well plates. So just like tiny little tissue cultures, typically. Um, so they're sitting there for a while and that can evaporate even with the lids on. So I like to keep giving them some new water. <laughs> yeah, and change it out just so that they're happy. It's four weeks is a pretty long time to be sitting in a little area like that. You have to remind the, uh, the committee member who is staying will continue in the, in the defense uh, in the examination. But if it, there is any other question from the public, but if there is no other question, I want to say thank you so much for everybody for coming from LS uh, Defense. <laughs>
It's in the third floor. Not for long. Thank you. 